My name is Amanda Van Annen. Welcome to Beauty and the Beat. Join me and my co-hosts, Betsy Zane and Sophia Brad, as we pierce beyond the beauty myth and get face-to-face with reality. Highs and lows of fashion to the challenges of motherhood, the traumas of life, heartbreak of relationships gone wrong, and how to find purpose and discover your true, authentic self. Welcome to episode 10. Today we'll be talking with Gaz Chan. Gaz Chan is a Chinese energy healing practitioner. She's also certified in Kundalini Yoga, DNA Theta Healing, Aroma Touch, Energetics, Akashic Records, Quantum Touch, Fifth Dimensional Quantum Healing, Pranic Healing, The Emotion Code, Star Magic Healing, and is a Master IET Practitioner and a Master NLP Life Coach. She has studied psychic mediumship with various teachers, including Lisa Williams, Tony Stockwell, and Thomas John, and has completed astral travel at the International Academy of Consciousness. Gaz has a private practice in Los Angeles, California, where she clears past life traumas and karmas, and also teaches weekend workshops. Gaz believes in magic and miracles, her world vision is a planet full of psychic healing, superheroes. Helping people find their purpose, live their potential, and use their gifts is her purpose. Gaz, welcome to Beauty and the Beat. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you for coming here. Now, I was so excited to have Gaz on here because I have experienced her work. And I can't say it's one of those things in life where you just, I can't explain it. It's so mystic and magical, but it does work. And I just wanted her to come on here and tell us a lot more about what she does and how she does it and how it can help you in your life. So Gaz, my first question for you is, how did you start on this journey? Well, we're going back probably about 12, 13 years when my son was a baby he had about seven colds back to back with maybe one or two days in between of wellness. So I contacted a healer that I knew and he put me in touch with his master. So I waited three weeks for a 20 minute phone session and this energy master got on the phone and cleared some stuff from my son who was just a baby at the time. He was about one year old. He's a one year old, yeah. And he cleared some stuff from my son, but he didn't clear anything that was his. He cleared my stuff and my ex-husband's stuff from my son. So the next day, my son was well and he stayed well. And this energy master said that he was doing a lecture at the Bodhi Tree bookstore, which at the time was on Melrose Avenue in Los Angeles. So I went down to his event and watched him demo his work. And he worked on several different people and just created magical, miraculous healing within a minute or two. And so I approached him afterwards to acknowledge him and he convinced me to enroll into his workshop. I wasn't convinced that I could do it or wanted to. So I came home and my mum was visiting from England at the time. And I said to her, well, you know, everyone tells you that you have this healing energy and you're a healer. Maybe you should go and do this workshop. But my mum is a very smart lady. She said, "Um, I'll pay for you. I'll gift it to you for your birthday. And I still wasn't convinced. So she said, why don't you go learn it so that you can work on your son? And that's what hooked me. That's what sold me. So I was enrolled. So I accepted the gift and I went to my first workshop and it was just three days for the weekend. And I started working on people from the very first weekend and word got around. And then I just started working more and more and more people. And it just grew like that. So 
it was never something you intended to do or something you had always it was almost like you had a calling from what I can see. It definitely wasn't something that I would have chosen for myself. I wasn't convinced mm -hmm. that I was able to do that. And also I had my own stories of, you know, I, I was a wild child and have a very colorful past. So I didn't see myself as this kind of pure, holier than thou person who lived a clean life. And so it didn't make sense to me for me to do this kind of line of work. But I remember one time after the divorce, I got really frustrated and I kind of yelled at the universe. And I was like, universe, you know, what do you want me to do? If you want me to be this healer type person, which I don't think I am, but if that's what you want me to do, if that's how you think I can serve humanity, then you need to make sure that I have a full-time client list, full-time clinic for the next two weeks. And I was very clear on my conditions. And within two weeks, I had a full-time practice. Wow, that's amazing. So it was just like something you tried, something pulled you towards it. You started practicing this and all of a sudden, everything started working in your life. Now, I know you practice several modalities. Could you tell us a bit about the different modalities you practice? Because I know you do the Akashic Records, you do like karmic healing, you do all sorts of things. Could you talk a bit about them? Yeah, so the Chinese energy healing I use to clear karma, karmic debts, karmic issues, and also past life traumas. Well, in the 3D world where past, present, and future, there's a time is linear, we call it past lives. But in the 5D paradigm, there is no past, present, and future. Time is not linear. So it would, it would be considered a parallel lifetime. So yeah, I use the Chinese energy healing to clear some negative emotions or traumas, negative beliefs, limiting beliefs, specific addictions, not just substance, but addictions to emotions, addiction to a state of being. And then I use the DNA theta healing to clear what is consciously bothering someone, whereas the Chinese energy healing, I use that to tap into the subconscious. A lot of things are stored in the subconscious, so that needs to be reprogrammed. And then energetics is kind of like the same as Chinese energy healing, but like a shortcut version. The Akashic Records is to read soul lessons. So I use the Akashic Records to find out the soul lessons for the person. And then the quantum touch is about running energy. So sometimes I'll run energy through someone's body or through the organ. And the fifth dimensional quantum healing is basically energetic sweeps or extractions. So you can use that for exorcism and injuries. And then the pranic healing is also sweeping energetically the body and the chakras. So you want to clear the chakras. And then the emotion code is also removing trapped emotions from specific organs and systems. IET is working with the archangels, and that's more of a hands-on modality. But you can also do that remotely by quantum entangling a doll or a soft toy. Or you can pull up someone's hologram and use IET on that. And NLP is neuro-linguistic programming. So it's basically just reprogramming the conscious and the subconscious, right? Changing, reframing the stories and the negative limiting beliefs. And then every now and then, spirit will come through and have a message for the client as well. Okay, that's interesting. So you talk about spirit, you talk about these different energy modalities. And I know like with some of your work, the client doesn't have to be present in the room. You can do a lot of this work remotely. Now tell me a bit about that. And because for a lot of people getting their mind around that thinking, okay, are you going through Zoom <laughs> or is it through the phone line? <laughs> how is this remote work working? Yeah. You know, how does it work, you know, in simple layman's terms? Yeah. Well, it's the same as like me and you are talking and I can tell if you're happy or upset or sad or frustrated, you don't have to be in front of me for me to tune into your energy field. I just set the intention, I'm going to tune into Amanda's energy field and see what's going on. So you can do that over the phone, 
when you talk to a friend on the phone or say, for example, you call up um, customer service, uh, you can tell if the person is has great bedside manners. You can tell if they're having a bad day. You can tell when they're being rude. Now, you can say, oh, it's because I can hear it. But we actually, 70% of our communication is energetic. So you don't mm. have to be able to hear someone's tone of voice. You can feel them energetically. It's just not something that we've been taught to sense. So everything is done through energy and the connection you have to them through their energetic field. And therefore, that's how the healing works. Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, they need to be receptive first. Some people will, it doesn't happen very often, but every now and then someone will say, you know, I'd like a session, I'd like to clear some blockages or receive some healing. But then you can tell that they are not very receptive. They're blocking you. So that needs to be cleared out before you can actually work on clearing the blockages out. But yeah, any living thing has an energy field. So you just learn to drop into the energy field of that person or animal, whatever, and all the information is there. So something I want to talk about whilst we're talking about this is the fact that also scientists have proven that our muscles have memories of traumas, for example, like the body remembers traumas. And I know a lot of people, I mean, I'll actually say most people carry a lot of trauma which they think they dealt with, but it's somewhere in their system. And how do you go about of getting this trauma out of the body and releasing it? Yeah, there's one thing to know that you are carrying trauma, like mentally, psychologically, emotionally. But then that doesn't mean that it's cleared energetically. So that's what I do. I just go into wherever it's stored. Maybe it's the right lung. Maybe it's the left adrenal. Maybe it's the right kidney. Maybe it's the testy or the ovaries. And I just energetically clear it from the organs or the systems or even the subtle bodies by simply directing my thought to their solar plexus or their heart center or their midline. Okay, I get that. So that brings me to the magic not the magic word, but the word that everybody talks about, karma, the effect of karma on our current life situation. I mean, people that don't even believe in karma know what the word is, what it means, you know, paying for past debts. And from what I believe and from what I've read, karma is not only about what you're going through in this life. It's you also have family karma sometimes that is affecting your current being. Mm -hmm. Now, how would you go about clearing something like that? And how do you, through your work, how do you investigate exactly what's going on with that client at that moment, if it's karmic or if it's trauma? And I know it's energetic clearing, but what modality or, yeah, you know, if you me. I would use Chinese energy healing. Yes, most trauma is karma related. So if someone has physically or mentally, emotionally or sexually abused me, chances are I've done that to them or their family members in another lifetime. So sometimes you go and you investigate. And then other times it's just quite obvious. This is it's the word that pops up when you tune in. And yes, we have individual karma, but we also absorb or carry karma from our ancestors. Every family have their karma. Every country has their karma. Every race has their karma. So karma is like a massive spider web with lots of different strands. It's multi-layered. So how does one break away from this? How do we break away from the bonds of karma? I know you might say you can never break away from it, but maybe ease it should, is what I should be saying, like ease the karmic effects. I mean, everyone comes into this lifetime with a, a good dose of, I guess you can say good and bad or positive and negative, although the soul does not perceive karma as good or bad. The soul does not perceive karma as positive or negative. It just is. The ego wants to label everything positive and negative. This is good. This is bad. 
that we all come in with a good dose of, I guess, positive and negative that plays out. And one of the reasons why we're here is to resolve our karmic issues. If we don't resolve the karmic issues, we will return and have to repeat those lessons because lessons don't go away until they are resolved or learned. Now, how do I clear karmic issues? By using Chinese energy healing and going there and clearing stuff. I find the more we clear, the higher the vibration and the lessons become less intense. I mean, as long as you're living, you'll always have lessons, right? Because once mm -hmm. your lessons are complete, you will just exit the physical realm. So it's not about wanting a life where there are no lessons, no karma, no challenges. But I find the clients who have regular, consistent sessions, and even my students who I encourage to trade sessions you know, on a weekly basis, they just get to elevate their lifestyle and a lot of things don't affect them. So their quality of life vastly improves. That's not to say that they'll never get sick or, right, because we're all going to physically die. So we're all going to physically get sick. It's not to say that their life is perfect, but they do definitely elevate their human experience. So it's about elevating your human experience. And in, in return, as you elevate that experience, obviously you also change the world around you because your experience changes. And as you experience different things, you manifest different things around you. I've personally been to sessions. I, I think I've had like three or four sessions with Gars and I've seen the effects on my life and she's done some Chinese energy healing on me. And I remember sitting there and as she was doing the work, thinking, okay, I don't understand what's going on, but something's going on. And I did see effects of it later. And I would say the effects in my life were very, you know, it's very subtle. And I feel like you also have to be ready to notice. And you, like everything in life, you have to be willing to want to change. You have to be willing because no one can force you to do what you're not willing. It's not just like you go to the circus and the magician just wore one to one and everything's okay. You have to be willing to change. And it does affect you on a much deeper level. And for me, I feel like you also have to be seeking, not only willing, you have to be seeking to find something deeper within you. So guys, a question I have for you is, I know you're doing this and you're doing all this work and helping people. Now, if someone was going through a problem, apart from calling you, what will be one of the things you would say they should do? Like, what will be the first step? If someone was, let's say, had a life-changing situation, a traumatic situation, going through immense anxiety or stress, what would your advice be? It depends on the person, but I feel like energy healing modalities should be taught in school. It should be common knowledge. So if they were going through something very intense, I would suggest that they find a class or a workshop near them. And, you know, they can always ask the universe to bring them the right teacher and the right workshop and the right modality and the right class and go from there. Yes, you can call your friends, you can find a therapist, you can journal, you can meditate, you can do all these things. But if you really want to empower yourself, I would say be proactive in finding a modality. Some people even, like I had some people from Australia taking my Zoom workshop and they were 17 hours ahead. That shows dedication, right? They're really committed to breaking ancestral patterns. And when we heal ourselves, we're not just healing, I'm not just healing me, I'm healing my whole lineage. I'm healing my ancestors and my descendants, right? So that's what got me to my first self-help workshop when I was 19 years old. I was like, I'm seeing this pattern, this very destructive pattern. How can I change this? And the universe sent me the right teacher and the right workshop. And that's how my journey began into clearing abuse and toxic relationships and trauma. So I would say, yeah, go find a class, a teacher. You can mm -hmm. do, there's so many online classes now, or you can 
get on a plane and fly somewhere. Like, although right now there's a pandemic and people aren't really doing workshops in person, but there are tons of stuff online that they can immerse themselves in. Okay. Um, something that was very interesting from what you said was patterns. I think a lot of times we see patterns in our life. We see the pattern in our parents' lives and we refuse to notice. And it's funny because through my spiritual knowledge, I've come to see patterns in a lot of things in my life that relate to my father's life or my mother's life. And I'm like, oh my God, it's so similar. And at the time it's happening, you're not really seeing it like that unless you want to see it like that. And I have to always remind myself consciously that I've got to break that pattern. That cannot be happening in my life. It's not that it cannot, but it's, I've seen the outcome from my father. I've seen the outcome from my mother. And I'm like, I don't want that. And I feel like when it comes to breaking patterns, it's one of the most difficult things for us as humans to do because it's learning new behavior and learning a new way of living. What do you think about that? Yeah, we all have been downloaded so many programs and we've absorbed and we're playing out so many programs and patterns of our ancestors. We don't just take on our parents' physical resemblance. We also take on their trauma and our grandparents' trauma and our great-grandparents' trauma or ancestral curses or spells or patterns or programming. It is difficult to break the patterns, but I feel when you are committed to your journey of transformation, which I feel like life is, then anything is possible. But you have to be really committed. It's like if you're training for a triathlon, you need to be really committed. If you want to see results, you need to be really committed. Yeah, you're true. So commitment has a lot to do with it. But something I found interesting from what you just said was about ancestral curses and spells. Now, or ancestral karma. Like I've always believed, and I think I came to this conclusion from that exactly what you said, that if we inherit likeness of our parents and we inherit their DNA, we must inherit their trauma. Because, you know, we are basically just them, but in another, we've just inherited two different people came together and that's another person. So there, if you look like them, you find people that even speak like their parents and similar voices, similar thought patterns. So I came to the conclusion that we therefore must inherit their trauma. And that's a very important point because I feel like the vast majority of people, even scientists don't think that way, but they're beginning to, because I've read research where they're like finding out a lot of things about DNA, because we always think, yeah, we just inherit the blood type. We look like our parents. How can we inherit their thoughts? But for me personally, I started realizing that because I used to have dreams and I started actually putting it together in my life that some of these dreams cannot be my present life. And I don't necessarily think they're my past life, but maybe they are somebody else's in my lineage's life because I have their memories, right? So just as I, as we all go to bed and remember our dreams, if you are made up of your mother and your father and your grandmother and your grandfather, apart, sometimes the dreams you dream and you don't understand why could probably be a dream from their past. And it's thinking to you and your, and I think that's so important because it all goes back to this thing of the world, the universe, energy, and we're all energetic beings having a human experience. And I feel like the world is going in that direction now. People are becoming, beginning to understand that. Technology has helped a lot because technology has helped people get the word out there and people learn more about spirituality and that type of stuff. But what do you feel about the whole, the current state of the world now? And, you know, we're going through a pandemic. There's a lot happening. And where do you think the future lies for us as human beings? Again, there are, there are different layers to this, right? On the surface level, it's a terrible thing. People are unemployed. People are dying. People are shut in their homes. But on, a, on another level, I know that a lot of starseeds are being activated right now. They're coming online right now. 
we are literally being called to focus on what is the most important thing in our lives, family and returning to nature. I feel a big shift happening in the collective conscious. That's what I feel. And it is an alignment with the age of Aquarius. And it's in alignment with all the indigo children, crystal babies, rainbow children that are present in the world. Now, I understand that there are people who complain we want things to go back to normal. But normal wasn't actually working for most of the people. A lot of people are enslaved and they don't realize that they are enslaved. Most people are not working in a job that they love. Most people don't go to a job Monday to Friday or six days a week or seven days a week that fills them with passion and fulfillment and contentment. And There are those who have maybe the uh, trimmings that distract them from realizing that we are actually enslaved. Maybe they have a nice car. Maybe they have a nice house. Maybe they can fly first class. Maybe they have five-star dinners. And they don't realize, you know, these are distractions. They don't realize that actually we are all kind of enslaved because how many people are working towards building their own empire? Not many. Most people are working to build someone else's empire. So a lot of people are working in jobs that they don't like to pay for things that they've been taught are valuable that will bring them happiness. But I've seen, I've worked on so many different types of people from different types of income bracket. And I can tell you that the ones who are really wealthy that I've worked on, who, you know, they've won Emmys, Oscars, multimillionaires, are not happy. I've got a question for you right there. I thought of it. I agree with you because we all hear those stories of suicide and you think this person had it all or they had all of this and they committed suicide. But a question I've always had is when they know they're not happy, that moment they know they're not happy and they come to see someone like you that's helping them work on themselves, work with their energy. Why don't they just make a decision at that point that, listen, I'm not happy. I'm just going to live a different life. But a lot of them still go on, even though they're seeing all these healers and in the living in this illusion until they get to the stage where they can't handle it anymore and get and then go on drugs or alcohol or end up killing themselves. Why do you think that is? Well, there are a lot of people who are, um, you know, have the riches and the fame. And uh, that's something that they've been working towards their whole life. So when they have it, and they don't feel the way they think that they would feel, they assume that there's something wrong with them. And they assume that they can't be helped because they have everything. Why aren't they happy? Why aren't they fulfilled? Why aren't they happy to wake up in the morning? Why aren't they grateful? There must be something wrong with them. There must be something wrong with me. Maybe it's not possible for me to be happy. But there's also a lot of trauma there. There's a lot of trauma that motivates people to become successful. There's a lot of trauma that motivates people to become famous. There's a lot of trauma that motivates people to become rich, financially rich. And whilst they're chasing those goals, they don't work on themselves. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. But we also, people, someone else might argue that we live in a world where you're 16 years old, 18, you have to go to work, you have to make money. And I am on your side. I totally agree. I think we live in a rat race. We live in a modern form of slavery. My thing is, I always say, people say I have a television, a car and a house, and they think they're not a slave. And I'm like, you're still a slave, but in better living conditions. That's all. (laughs) <laughs> and people don't see it. You know, they're, they're, I'm like, no, you're still a slave because 
the moment you stop that nine to five and the money stops coming in, you're on the street. So you're not going to be able to pay for your log cabin anymore. So you're still a slave until you take control of your life. And as you said, you know, work for yourself or become an entrepreneur or try to, you know, just give back to the world. But then, you know, on the other hand, I think if everybody was an entrepreneur, then maybe the world wouldn't, we all wouldn't have the things we have because somebody needs to work in the factory and make the clothes. Somebody needs to make sure we get food to eat. But on the other hand, I then look at another way where I think perhaps what it is, is we should pay those people more so they, they can enjoy the jobs they do. And the people at the top that are like the big corporate companies that are just paying the CEO like 200 million bonus should take less and give more to the people down there. So it becomes a more equal. Obviously, he doesn't have to get paid exactly the same, but a $5 per hour increase in their wages could make a massive difference in their lives and allow them to live a more fulfilling life. And it's funny because that's another issue I have with America, even though I live here, is I'm constantly contemplating moving back to London or Europe because I just find that people just don't work as hard there. They have a better standard of living. They spend more time with family and friends. And the older I grow, the more I think, I don't think I can last here that much longer because as much as it's chase, 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 and I must say, there are a lot of opportunities in America. America is one of the few places I know you can get on your computer, build a business and start making money instantly because we just don't have that mindset in Europe. People are doing it, but it's not at the level it is here. But on the other hand, when I look at most people, as you said, they're not happy with their jobs. They don't like what they do. I find uh, there's a lot of aggressive people here because they're frustrated. And I mean, even when I look at the dynamics, it's what's happening with politics at the moment, with Black Lives Matter issues, with, as a Black person, I came here and I knew about racism and we both come from the UK and I know it does exist even in the UK in different forms. But this was the first place I have come to in my life that I was conscious of actually being a Black person. Not that I was never conscious, but it made me so aware that I was different, if you get what I mean. Because I feel like in the UK, you know you're Black, of course, you're born Black. And my parents being from Africa, where we have leaders that are Black, everybody's Black, rich people, poor people, you know, it wasn't a big deal. But I feel like America was the first place I moved to in my life, in my whole life, after traveling around the world, where it's such a big issue. It's such a thing. And I just could not understand it. And it took a long time to process it. And even still, sometimes I just don't get it from both sides. Yeah, the segregation in this country is very strong. It's one of the things that I found to be very shocking. When I first visited New York in the 90s, I was coming from London, which is very multicultural. (laughs) And going to New York the segregation I found to be quite shocking because I thought I perceived New York to be a more progressive city than London. And so in that aspect, I was quite surprised. And then coming to LA, it was even worse than New York. But then I learned the American history and and it's like, oh, okay, we don't have the same history in England. So that makes sense. You know, the slavery and and all that kind of stuff, it sets up a different trajectory. But I agree with you, it's setting up that trajectory, but it is in us as conscious human beings, which is what's happening now to change that. I think in the last five, 10 years, I've seen so much change so quick, especially in this country, from the Me Too movement, which, and I feel like the core of it was the Me Too movement. I feel like the Me Too movement created so many movements, you know, the LGBTQ movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, I think from that, that just was like the catalyst for everything and everything just came, you know, and it was always there, all these things, but now it's a lot more open. Now, when we go back to spirituality and karma and this, and, you know, one thing you talked about earlier was, you know, how you have a race karma, like we have a race karma. So, and as a black person, you know, people, I mean, black people say this to each other. They're like, oh, we're cursed. Now, why do you think the Black race, you know, has experienced so much persecution from slavery to all this racism, segregation around the world, and people use the word Black as... And I find this so interesting because once we were royal, we were 
like I did part of my master's in China. And one thing they talked about was how the emperor back in the Ming dynasty actually went to Africa and he went to trade, not slavery. They traded with them. They brought back exotic animals and all of this. And once we were kings and queens and then we became slaves. So what do you think went wrong? Well, to be very, 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 very general, every race has their time to shine and every race has their time to fall. So it's not a matter of black people have done anything wrong, but like you said, you know, you've been kings and queens, um, you know, look at ancient Egyptian civilization. But Throughout the history of mankind, every race has had their time at the top and every race has had their time at the bottom because we as humans, when we signed up for this human experience, that's one of the things that we signed up for, to experience from all sides. Just like you've had lifetimes of being black, you've had lifetimes being white, you've had lifetimes of being Asian, you've had lifetimes being Spanish. You've had lifetimes of being a Leo, a Taurus, a Scorpion, mm-hmm. an Aquarius. You've been male and female. You've had lifetimes when you were wealthy. You've had lifetimes when you were, I guess, quote unquote, poor. You have raped others and you have been raped. So it's just a cycle that we go through. I wouldn't say that black people are cursed, although. It may seem that way. It may feel that way. But I feel like we are coming out of a lot of accepted abusive behavior. Like you said, the Me Too movement, sexual attacks against women, sexual abuse has always existed. But now the Me Too movement proves that as a collective, women are now saying, we're not tolerating or accepting this any more. The Black Lives Matter movement, racism has always existed, but we, it shows that we, the collective conscious is saying, we're not accepting this anymore. And the child trafficking next, people have abducted, stolen, eaten, kidnapped children since the beginning of time, sacrificed their firstborn to rituals and to sacrifices. But now we're getting to a point where the collective conscious is saying we're not accepting this anymore. So I feel like as a whole, we are moving out of things that we just accepted, you know, the abuse, the trauma that we just accepted. We're moving out of that and transitioning into a place where we are demanding healthier, healthier ways. Yeah. And technology plays a big part of that because I feel like due to technology, news travels much faster. People can put what's happening with them or an incident that's happened in their life on video, like it happened with George Floyd. And people can see it straight away and react. And we can put pressure on government and pressure on our senators and whatever in in the Senate, in the Congress to help us make decisions. But I also think this is a very important, I mean, what I feel is this is a shift for government as well. Mm -hmm. I feel like the future of governing the world is going to change. And we're at a time where we're at conflict, where it's about to change, but the powers that be are trying to keep it the way it is. Because people want a different way of being ruled. People want representation. People want to be seen. People want to be heard. And I feel like technology has helped us achieve that. At least we can be seen. We can, your voice, any voice can be seen now. Any voice can be heard. Your creativity can be seen. You don't need a big network or CBS or NBC. You can put your stuff on YouTube. All you need is a laptop. And that's happening all around the world today. And Also, I feel, you know, with the situation with Africa or Middle East or Asia, I feel like the Western world has written history the way they want it. Like until I learned myself that the Chinese had been to Africa even before the Westerners, I didn't know that. Most people think the British or the Portuguese or the Spanish got to Africa first. No one talks about the that the Chinese got there before all of them. And this is a well-known documented fact in China. 
people know that, that during the Ming dynasty, because they have it on the Ming vases and everything, giraffes and everything, which were only in Africa then. So, and apparently the battalion of ships that went were so big, like they had these ginormous ships they built, which were bigger than what Christopher Columbus even had. But nobody talks about that in history. And I found that fascinating because it was one of the things I learned about. And I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah, they were trading with them. And they were, it made me also think because, you know, in Africa, we have a lot of people who are born with slanted eyes. And I thought, oh, was it from back then? But this is a part of history that no one talks about. So I think part of it is also our responsibility as human beings to start finding out about our own history not only through books that we read, but really delving beyond history books. It's like even the way history is told in America to people and about slavery and about that people are finding out new facts every day that most people just take for granted because in our schools, it's not taught. You know, there's a one way. And there's the saying, how can you know where you're going when you don't even know who you are? Which I feel is part of the African-American experience because a lot of their history has been It's only now they're really getting, you know, there's this renaissance of African-Americans even going to Africa, moving to Africa, wanting to know more about the motherland, wanting to learn where their roots are from, feeling the earth, just even if it's just to go there and just even that trip just gives them hope that I came from somewhere. I belong to somewhere. I belong to someone. I, this is my land of my ancestors. And it's amazing how, like going in your line of work, how that energetic experience just that shift in energy could just change someone's life from just going back to where they came from and just feeling the ancestors and meeting people that were once related to them or are still related to them generations ago. And so I feel that there's a big shift in our whole life and in what we're doing. And a lot of people are becoming more spiritual. And this whole coronavirus thing was I think someone we met something we as human beings manifested to happen in order to cause that shift because everything's shifting and we're just at the beginning. Just at the beginning. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) We are just at the beginning. It is. It is. I can already see it. Everything's moved online. Everyone's starting online businesses. Everyone's just I mean on my street where I live, every week there's a moving van. People are moving out of the cities. People are saying, I don't want to live this life. I want to live a a nice, peaceful life where I can still work from home. So things are changing. Mm -hmm. So now we've ranted on a bit. Let's go back into your energy work. I wanted to say, depending on what's going on in someone's life, what will the process be for you helping them with whatever they're going through? So if someone came to you and said, I have a problem with my relationship. Would you use a different modality depending on what problem it is? Or would you just say, I do Chinese energy healing first and then I I go into this next? It just comes intuitively to me. So I interchange and use a mix of different modalities because I find that, you know, every modality has its strengths and weaknesses, just like uh, exercise. If you take tennis classes, you're going to be learning tennis and it may work some muscles and not others, or if that's a bad example, but you know, different exercises have different rules and just like different modalities have different strengths and weaknesses. So I combine a mixture of different modalities to get the maximum effect for my client. Usually relationship issues is always karma. So I go about clearing the karma. Now, I always let my clients know I'm not going to clear stuff so that you stay together. I'm not going to clear stuff so that you break, break, break up. I'm just going to clear stuff so that whatever is for your highest good will just come in organically and easily. So then I clear the karmic issues between them. I also sever some psychic cords. I'll also retrieve some soul fragments, and then I will also clear up any trauma that they've had in relationships. And sometimes they've absorbed their father or mother or ancestors' trauma in relationships. There are also some negative limiting beliefs that they have. 
around why it's not working or why they cannot be happy in relationship. So yeah, there's, there's all kinds of different things that is cleared for people who are experiencing relationship issues. Yeah, that's interesting. So another point I wanted to touch on was the fact that, you know, you do these classes where you're teaching other healers how to go into the world and help other people and to heal and kind of become teachers like you. How did that come about? (laughs) Well, actually, many years ago, my son said to me, oh, mommy, you should be a teacher. You'd be a great teacher. And I kind of scoffed. I was like, (laughs) no way, never. It's never going to happen. And then I realized that my son is very gifted. He's always been able to see spirits and orbs and angels and he remembered his past lives and I thought, oh, I need to put him into a some kind of school where he can develop this because most children are really connected, but by the time they're twelve years old they it's just they're disconnected and it's kind of um it's not encouraged to be sensitive, it's not encouraged to be intuitive. And uh depending on the household family members tend to say, oh, that doesn't exist. It's not real. You're making it up. You're lying, blah, blah, blah. So I was looking for a teacher who could teach my son, but I couldn't find any teachers who were teaching children. And so I thought, well, if you can't find it, you need to create it. So I thought, well, before I start teaching children, maybe I should start teaching adults first. And once I get a hang of teaching adults, then I can extend to children. And I was driving down the street one day in Los Angeles, and I was having this debate about whether I should teach or not. And I came up with a whole list of reasons why I should teach. And I also came up with a whole list of reasons why I shouldn't teach. And then I got fed up and I just said, universe, just tell me, just be really clear with me and tell me if I should teach or not. I I don't know. And then I stopped at the traffic light and I turned to my left and on the side of a van, it said teach. So I was like, okay, I guess I'm teaching. (laughs) So you just went into teaching just like that? Yep. It just happened very quickly, very smoothly. As soon as I set my intention, as soon as I decided, okay, I'm going to do this, then it just all fell into place. So you're going out there. I know I want to do one of your courses. And do you teach all the modalities in one course or do you have different courses? Because you have quite a lot of an extensive practice. So do you just focus on Chinese energy healing or you do all of them? Well, I used to do two day workshops, a level one, level two, level three. But this year I'm doing a seven day workshop and it's pretty intensive. So I teach people, students, how to tap into energy fields, clear energetic blockages, seeing auras, strengthening auras, remote view, psychometry, psychic development, Akashic records, cancelling soul contracts, mediumship readings, medical mediumship, removing psychic cores, clearing chakras, deleting traumas, karmas, negative limiting beliefs, extracting entities, psychic surgery, quantum jumping, past life readings, astral travel, IET, curing or neutralizing phobias. And I also have my students meet their animal totem, gatekeeper, spirit guide, guardian angel, starseed family. And we do some healing the inner wounded child and all kinds of magical stuff. Yeah. So that's really, really interesting. That's a lot for them to put to take on in the course. So that means when they get home, they must have a lot of work to keep on doing, right? To just keep in the flow because this type of work requires constant practice to hone. Yeah. So taking this course is, um, you have to be really dedicated. It must be something like you really, really want to do because you have to constantly be practicing it. It's not something you just learn and then say, okay, I've learned how to do that. Yeah. That's it. So a lot of the students you get must be really dedicated. Now, on that note, it's been wonderful having you. I mean, I'm still so excited and there's so much I want to ask, but (laughs) (laughs) we'll be talking forever. And I'm sure I'm going to have you back on the show. But I wanted you to tell our listeners 
where they can find you and your website, Instagram and social media handles. Okay. Well, if you want private one-on-one sessions, you can go to ChineseEnergyHealing.com. If you're interested in taking the workshops, you can go to AlchemistsArtsHealing.com. I'm also on Facebook and as Chinese Energy Healing and as Alchemists Arts Healing. And my Instagram is at Chinese Energy Healing. Yes, so you can find Gaz on Instagram at Chinese Energy Healing. You heard that, people. And she has amazing videos where she talks about several things on healing and topics about healing, etc. And you can listen to her there, but you can also contact her through Facebook, Instagram, or any of the various social media apps or directly go to her website. Yeah, Gaz, thanks for coming on Beauty on the Beach. I'm so happy you came on. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.